Can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So thank you all for coming along to this extremely important and exciting event. It's a pleasure and an absolute honour to introduce Zara Ahmed to you all tonight. Zara Ahmed is an independent scholar and feminist writer, prior to which she held a professorship in race and cultural studies at Goldsmiths University of London, where she also established the Centre for Feminist Research. Zara resigned from this post in 2016 in protest at the institution's failure to deal with the problem of sexual harassment a problem that Zara continues to research and work on. She's also held an appointment at Lancaster University in Women's Studies and visiting appointments at Cambridge University, Rutgers University, the University of Sydney and the University of Adelaide. Zara's vital contributions to queer, feminist and anti-racist scholarship are numerous. She blogs at feministkilljoys.com, which if any of you aren't aware of, you should make yourselves aware. <laughs> she has published eight solo authored books um, with more on the way, as well as um, three co-edited volumes and numerous special issues, along with a number of very important essays. As a result, in 2017, Zara was awarded the prestigious Kessler Award, an award from the City University of New York, given to a scholar who has, over a number of years, produced a substantive body of work that has significantly influenced the field of LGBTQ studies. Indeed, her solo authored books alone include Differences That Matter, Feminist Theory and Postmodernism, which was published with Cambridge University Press in 1998, Strange Encounters, Embodied Others in Postcoloniality, published with Rootledge in 2000, The Cultural Politics of Emotion, published in 2004, which is now on its second edition, Queer Phenomenology, Orientations, Objects and Others, published by Duke University Press in 2006. The Promise of Happiness, also with Duke, which um, actually won the, the Feminist and Women's Studies Association Book Prize in 2012. And then one of my personal faves on being included, Racism and Diversity in Institutional Life, also by Duke. Willful Subjects in 2014, and most recently, in 2017, her brilliant and internationally viral <coughs> Living a Feminist Life, also with Duke. So these works have been translated into numerous languages, including German, Swedish, Turkish, Spanish, Korean, and Finnish, among others. Um, and across these various works, Zara assembles a whole host of differing traditions and thinkers, continental philosophy, black feminism, post-colonial literature, queer theory, the work of Stuart Hall, Audre Lorde, Sigmund Freud, Franz Fanon, Adrian Rich, among so many others, in order to study the um, everyday ways that power operates and is secured and challenged. And in so doing, Zara has introduced and developed a number of very important concepts that I'm sure many of you have heard of or experienced that seem to travel, pop up and articulate themselves in a whole host of surprising locations and spaces. And perhaps the one she is best known for is feminist killjoy, a term and perhaps an analytic of power that has provided so many of us with the language or grammar to articulate the structural position that we occupy as feminists dedicated to disrupting the everyday reproduction of sexism, or as Zara puts it, how in pointing out the problem, we become the problem. I first encountered Zara from afar in 2011 when I was fresh out of undergrad um, at a one day long workshop in London that Zara had organised on the work and life of Audre Lorde. <coughs> Throughout the day, Zara reminded us of Audre's commitment to the radical and creative politics of anger, self-care as an act of warfare, and that, importantly, the master's tools can never dismantle the master's house. I remember thinking to myself, I think this is a feminist academy that I really want to be part of, and here I am today. Um, and since that event, Zara wrote the introduction to the publication of Audre Lorde's Your Silence Will Not Protect You, in which she reminds us of Lorde's important words, revolution is a process, not a one-time event. And for me, Audre's phrase also captures the essence of Zara's work, her long-standing commitment to queer feminist of colour scholarship and activism, and her keeping alive and putting to use of the legacies of the important works of the women of colour who have come before us. Tonight, Zara will be presenting from her forthcoming book project, What's the Use on the Uses of Use, out with Duke University Press in 2019, um, and which forms a third volume in a trilogy of publications coming after The Promise of Happiness and Willful Subjects, 
that together comprise a unique archive of anti-racist, queer, feminist, critical thinking and methods. Her talk tonight is titled Queer Use. Zara is going to talk for around an hour or for as long as it takes and after that we'll hopefully have some time for a couple of questions. Um, but don't worry if we run out of time we'll try and um, continue the conversation here or outside. Um, so without further ado, please join me in welcoming the brilliant Sarah Ahmed to Cambridge. everyone for being here, and for Heather for all the work in getting me here. Uh, this lecture is dedicated to my queer family, who are all here, to Sarah and to Poppy. <laughs> the title of the talk is Queer Use. I want to start my consideration of queer use by attending to uses of queer. Queer, a word with a history, a word that has been flung like a stone, picked up and hurled at us, a word we can claim for us. Queer, odd, strange, unseemly, disturbed, disturbing. Queer, a feeling, a sick feeling, feeling queer as feeling nauseous. In all the uses of queer, queer to describe anything that is noticeable because it is odd. Queer and fragility were often companions. In one of George Eliot's essays, Three Months in Weimar, the narrator describes the sound of an old piano thus. Its tones now so queer and feeble, like those of an invalid old woman whose voice could once make a heart beat with fond passion. Feeble, frail, invalid, incapacitate, falter, weak, tearful, worn, tear, wear, queer too, queer is there too. These proximities tell a story. A queer life might be how we get in touch with things, at the very point at which they or we are worn or worn down, those moments when we break or break down, when we shatter under the weight of history. The sounds of an old piano evoking the sound of an invalid old woman. Could this evocation vibrate with affection? Could a queer heart beat with passion? for what is wavering and quavering. That some of us can live our lives by assuming that word, queer, by saying yes to that word, shows how past use is not exhaustive of a word or thing, however exhausted a word or thing. As Judith Butler notes an excitable speech, an aesthetic enactment of a rigorous word may both use the word and mention it. That is, use the word to produce certain effects, but also at the same time, make reference to that very use, calling to it as, attention to it as a citation, situating that use within a citational legacy, making that use into an explicit discursive item to be reflected on, rather than a taken for granted operation of ordinary language. We can disrupt the meaning of an insult by making its usage audible as a history that does not decide once and for all what a word can do. So to queer use might be to make use audible, to listen to use, <coughs> to bring to the front what ordinary seems into the background. Sometimes words can be used as if they can be cut off from their history when an insult is thrown out, for instance, and reaches its target, but is defended as just banter, as something you can or should make light of. If we reuse the word queer, we hold on to the weight the baggage. Eve Sedgwick suggests that what makes queer a politically potent term is how it cleaves to childhood scenes of shame. So queer acquires force and vitality precisely because we refuse to use the word to make light of the history. To recycle or to reuse a word is to reorientate one's relation to a scene that holds its place as memory, as container, however leaky. Queer as reused, reuse as queer use. So in today's lecture, I'll be drawing on arguments from a book I've recently completed, What's the Use? And in that book, I follow use around, the way I followed happiness in The Promise of Happiness and the Will in Wilson Subjects. Use, 
is a small word with a big history. It's a busy word. Use has had and does have many uses. And following use has allowed me to connect bodies of work that are usually assumed to be distinct, such as literatures in design, psychology, and biology that make use of use to explain the acquisition of form. So following use has allowed me to explore how worlds are shaped from, as it were, the bottom up. So uses of use. So in this section, I want to offer meditation on use as biography, as a way of telling a story of things. Use when used as a verb can mean to employ for some purpose, to expend or consume, to treat or behave toward, to take unfair advantage of or exploit, or to habituate or accustom. Use is a relation as well as an activity that often points beyond something, even when use is about something, to use something points to what something is for. Some objects are made in order to be used. We might call these objects simply designed. A cup is made in order that I have something to drink from. It is shaped this way with a hole at its heart empty so that it can be filled by liquid. We might summarise the implied relation as for is before. However, if there's something shaped around what it is for, that is not the end of the story. As Howard Rosati notes in the theory of Christ, use need not correspond to intended function. Most, if not all, objects can have a use, or more accurately, be made useful by being put to use. A sledgehammer can pound or it can be used as a paperweight or lever. A handsaw can cut a board and be used as straight edge or to make music. A chair can be sat in and used to pop open a door. These uses make them useful objects, but since they are unrelated to the intended purpose and function for which these objects were made, knowing these uses doesn't necessarily reveal much about these objects. So use can correspond to intended function, but use does not necessarily correspond to intent and function, and that not, not necessarily, is an opening. I'm not so sure if uses are quite as unrevealing about things as was actually implies, at least here. I'm being told something about the qualities of a sledgehammer, that it can be used to be a paperweight. That a sledgehammer can be used as a paperweight is telling me something about the heaviness of a sledgehammer. Something cannot be used for anything, which means use is a restriction of possibility that is material. Nevertheless, there is something queer about use because intentions do not exhaust possibilities. The keys that are used to unlock a door can be used as a toy, perhaps because they are shiny and silver, perhaps because they jangle. Queer uses, when things are used for purposes other than the ones for which they were intended, still reference the qualities of things. Queer uses may linger on these qualities, rendering them all the more lively. Or, queer use could be thought of as perversion, improper use. The word perversion can refer not only to the deviation from what is right and true, but to the improper use of something. So we would not call the child who turned that key into a toy a pervert, even if that is not what the key is for, because the child is expected to play with such things. But a boy who plays with the wrong toy, a toy hoover for instance, that is intended for a girl, the fact that a toy hoover exists at all is clearly deeply <laughs> concerning, <laughs> might be understood as converted or at least as on the way to conversion. So correcting the boy's use of the toy is about correcting more than behaviour in relationship to the toy or to the object, it is correcting how the boy is a boy. So this figure of a pervert might come up then as the one <coughs> whose misuse of things is a form of self-revelation. Note the implication in Rosati's argument that use makes something usable, which implies that possibility follows actuality, a reversal of the usual sequence. And use seems to have what I think of as a strange temporality. <coughs> use can also make something used. When we think of something as being used, we might think of buying something second-hand, rather like this book, which is a book on hands that was handy. A used book is usually cheaper than a new book. The more signs of usage equal the less value, unless the user is esteemed when the value of a person rubs off on the value of a thing. Marx, in Capital, discusses wear and tear signs of usage in relation to machines. The material wear and tear of a machine is of two kinds. The one arises from use as coins wear away by circulating, the other from non-use 
as the sword rusts were left in its scabbard. And Marx showed how machinery intensified rather than saved labour. You have to get the most out of the machine before it wears out, a wearing that is passed on to workers, wearing as passing on and passing out, used as used up. So wear and tear in this economy is the loss of value determined by the extraction of value. To value use might require a change of values. We might value worn things, broken things, for the life they lived, for how they show what they know, the scratch as pedagogy, the wrinkle as expression. To value use would not be to, to romanticise what is preserved as a historical record. Signs of life can be signs of exhaustion, which is to say, signs of life can be signs of how a life has been extinguished. Perhaps we can think of use as a record of the fragility of a life. So in writing about use, I've deliberately made use of used books. And with this book in my hands, I could tell that others have been here before. I think of the reader who circled the word grief. I cannot trace you, but you left a trace. Use leaves traces in places. Something might be in use or out of use. When something breaks, it might be taken out of use by the lightless cup, which has lost its handle. When we think of something as in use, we might think of a sign on a door, occupied. The sign is familiar to us. It tells us the toilet is in use. It tells us that we cannot use a toilet until whoever is using the toilet is finished. So use often comes with instructions that are about maintaining social and bodily boundaries. Sometimes instructions are about who is allowed to use what for what? Take this image, which might also be familiar. <laughs> the sign makes a claim that the door is in constant use in order to justify an instruction. Keep clear. If you were to park a car or a bike in front of that door, you would become an obstruction. So becoming an obstruction describes the fate that awaits some uses and users. Or take this image of a post box. There is a sign that politely asks will be posted not to use a post box by posting a letter into the box. So if the toilet was occupied because it was in use, the post box is out of use because it is occupied. Although, of course, from another point of view, it is in use. The post box has provided a home for nesting birds. So intended functionality can mean who something is for, not just what something is for. And this means that something can be used by those for whom it was not intended. Queer use, when something is used by those for whom it was not intended. So can I add here that when I was writing my conclusion to the book, I realised that others before me have used queer use in exactly this way. As you can see in this article from 1899 referring to the queer use of cloisters to store his machine, the bicycle, um, in, in Holborn, London. So if we go back to the post box, that it becomes a nest, or can become a nest, is still telling us something about the nature of an object. What allows the box to be used to post letters, that in the slit, is what allows the birds to enter. If a change of function does not require a change of form, a change of function does require a sign, please do not use, to stop what would otherwise be usual, posting a letter through a box. The sign, we assume, is temporary. The box will come back into use as a post box when it ceases to be a nest. Back into use. Use can involve comings and goings. Take the example of a well-trodden path. The path exists because people have used it. Use involves contact and friction, the tread of feet smoothing the surface. The path is becoming smoother, easier to follow. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. How strange this sentence makes sense. Without use, that path might disappear, becoming overgrown or bumpy or unusable. Rather like this path, we know it's a path, but you can hardly see the sign for the, for the leaves. <coughs> so use then could be necessary for preservation. Use it or lose it. This is not only a natural and personal training, which it is, <laughs> it can also become a philosophy of life, not using, not being. If not using can mean not being, <coughs> then use can become useful as a technique. You can stop something from existing by making it hard to use. And use can also be a frame. A pad of paper might appear unused because the pencil marks have been erased. And frames of uses have uses. For example, many uses of land were not counted as uses 
because land use in Western culture was understood primarily in terms of cultivation. The labor theory of property was also a theory of use. John Locke's two treatises made extensive use of use. It cannot be supported. The land should remain common and uncultivated, such that he, God, gave it to the use of the industrial and rational. So use is defined here or restricted to agriculture and cultivation. Land that had not been cultivated becomes wasteland, unused, and thus available to be appropriated. Edward Said was attuned to this use of use. He described how Palestine was rendered a whole territory, essentially unused, unappreciated, misunderstood, to be made useful, appreciated, understandable. So you can declare something unused or assure something becomes unused as the grounds for justifying an appropriation. So used paths have many stories to tell. A path can appear like a line on a landscape, but a path can also be a route through life. Collectivity can be acquired as direction. The more a path is travelled upon, the clearer it becomes. A path can be cared for, maintained. Heterosexuality, for instance, can be understood as a path, a route through life, a path that is kept clear, maintained not only by the frequency of use, and a frequency could be an invitation, but by an elaborate support system. When it's harder to perceive, when a path is harder to follow, you might be discouraged, you might try and find another route. A consciousness of the need to make more of an effort can be a disincentive. Just think of how we can be dissuaded by perpetual reminders of just how hard something would be. Deviation is hard. Deviation is made hard. Use can ease the passage of things. William James cites the work of Dumont to make sense of habit. Everyone knows how a garment has been worn at a certain time, clings better to the shape of the body than when it was new. A lock works better after being used some time. At the outset, a certain force was acquired to overcome a certain roughness in the mechanism. So a garment becomes more attuned to the body the more that garment is worn. And I'll return to this well-used garment in, in due course. The example of the lock and key suggests that it's through use that things become easier to use. So if use takes time, use saves time. Less effort is required to complete an action. This idea that use keeps something alive or that use makes something easier to use is supplemented by another idea that was central to the emergence of modern biology, that use in making something stronger and disuse in making something weaker shapes the very form of organic life. For example, the mind disuse, a more frequent and continuous use of any organ gradually strengthens, develops and enlarges that organ and gives it a power proportion to the length of time that has been so used, while the permanent disuse of any organ imperceptibly weakens and deteriorates it and progressively diminishes its functional capacity until it finally disappears. These acquired modifications for Lamarck can be inherited to second law, what is known usually as use inheritance. So Lamarck's famous example is that of the giraffe's long neck, although he only uses that example once. And his other famous example, the blacksmith's strong arm, he doesn't use at all. So I've become very interested in examples of having their own biographies of use. But for Lamarck, in accordance to his theory, the long neck would grow longer, not through an act of volition, but as an effect of repeated efforts that have become directional in time. He describes efforts in a particular direction, when they are sustained or habitually made by certain parts of a living body, for the satisfaction of needs established by nature or environment, to cause an enlargement of the parts and the acquisition of a size and shape that they would not have obtained if these efforts had not become the normal activities of the animals exerting them, which is actually a fascinating um, quote in my view. So when an effort becomes normal, a form is acquired. And when such a form has been acquired, less effort will be needed. The giraffe does not have to reach so high to reach the foliage. So this is my language. Use inheritance translates as the lessening of the effort required to survive within an environment. We could pause here and pull out some of the queer implications of Lamarck's argument. If norms become forms in time, then forms lag behind norms. Stephen Jay Gould suggested that the time lag between behavioural change and formal change accounts for some of the oddest, queerest, and most curious 
of animal inventions. Um, Gould's examples include the flamingo, which dwell in hypothaline lakes in order to feed, they turn their heads upside down. A curious reversal in behaviour has engendered a complex inversion of form. So queer use could also be used to reference such inversions, how things end up, as it were, the wrong way up. An organism enters a new environment with its old form, suited to other styles of life. The behavioural innovation establishes a discordance between new function and inherited form, which is a really interesting idea as well as the temporal disjunction, as a disjunction between function and form. So forms here could be understood as a kind of temporal drag, to use Elizabeth Freeman's terms, the visceral pull of the past on the present. And when forms drag behind functions, that dragging is expressed queerly, in, to use rules of language, imperfections and odd solutions cobbled together from parts at hand. So I'm going to return to lingering forms and odd solutions in due course. So luck does imply, I think, that a use for something is sufficient to bring about its existence. And this was one of the reasons that Charles Darwin was rather disparaging about Lamarck's work because of the implication Darwin heard, rightly or wrongly, that organis organisms can bring what they need into existence. So we can find evidence of Darwin's disparagement in another used book, Darwin's personal copy of Lamarck's History Naturale. And he writes in the margin, because use improves an organ, wishing for it or its use produces it, exclamation mark, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And I've been writing about the overuse of exclamation marks, so I was very interested in that. Oh, so despite how Darwin and Lamarck appear to deviate from, at least from Darwin's point of view, on this question, the question of use, Darwin himself often represents natural selection and the law and of use and disuse as working together. And it's interesting to note that Darwin himself offers a reuse of the architect metaphor, despite how this metaphor, as a metaphor for natural selection, risks the implication of design. And I'm going to share this quote because I'm going to be picking up on it later when I talk about institutional use. Let an architect be compelled to build the edifice with uncut stones, fallen from a precipice. The shape of each fragment may be called accidental, yet the shape of each has been determined by the force of gravity, the nature of the rock and the slope of the precipice, events and circumstances, all of which depend on natural laws. But there is no relation between these laws and the purpose for which each fragment is used by the builder. The shape of the fragments of stone at the base of the precipice may be called accidental, but that is not strictly correct. For the shape of each depends on a long sequence of events, all obeying natural laws. But in regard to the use to which the fragments may be put, their shape may be strictly set to be accidental. So an architect can be a builder who makes use <laughs> of the stones without cutting them in order to fit a design. So these stones are thrown up or available in accordance with natural laws. But these stones are not made in order to be used, like that cup that is shaped so that it can be filled by water. If the shape of the stone is determined by a long sequence of events, it is an accident that the shape of this stone fits the shape of that hole in this wall. So, simply put, you are more likely to use a stone that happens to fit that space. For Darwin, at least here, use is hap, happenstance, or even, I would say, happy. And I'll return to Darwin's happy use of the architect metaphor in due course. So this second section, I just lost my water, <laughs> is called Institutional as Usual. <laughs> So my task in this section is to thicken the account of use I've offered thus far by thinking about the institutional as usual. We learn about the institutional from those who are trying to transform institutions. So in an early project, I talked to diversity practitioners about their work in trying to transform institutions. And going back to that data in writing this work, I realised how diversity work requires becoming conscious of use. Diversity workers are, after all, trying to transform institutional habits, not to use the well-used paths, not to flow the way things flow. But of course, at another level, diversity seems to be how things are flowing, a rather well-traveled path, used as an arrow even, which can be an instruction and thus a direction to go that way. The ease with which the word diversity travels might be why diversity work is such hard work. One diversity worker describes how diversity is a big shiny apple with a rotten core. It all looks wonderful, but the inequalities aren't being addressed. The word diversity is used more because it does less. 
diversity then becomes a sign of the difficulty of getting through. This same practitioner described her own work thus. It is a banging your head against a brick wall job. So here a job description becomes a wall description. If you keep banging your head, what happens to the wall? All you seem to have done is scratch the surface. And this is what diversity work often feels like, scratching the surface, scratching at the surface. So doing diversity work means you collect what I call simply wall stories. The wall becomes data, condensed information about institutions, and thus, I would add, about youth. So let me share with you a wall story. And like all wall stories, it is a long story. <laughs> so this is from a diversity practitioner. When I was first here, there was a policy that you had to have three people on every panel who had been diversity trained. And then there was a decision early on when I was here that it should be everybody, all panel members, at least internal people. They took that decision at the Equality and Diversity Committee, which several members of SMT were present at. But then the Director of Human Resources found out about it and decided that we didn't have the resources to support it, and he went to council with that taken out. And council were told they were happy to have just three members. Only a person on council was an external member of the diversity committee, went ballistic, I'm not kidding, went ballistic, and said the minutes didn't reflect what had happened in the meeting because the minutes of the decision was different to what actually happened, and I didn't take the minutes, by the way. And so they had to take it through and reverse it. And the council decision was that all people should be trained. And despite that, I then sat in meetings where they just continued saying that it has to be just three people on the panel. And I said, but no, council changed their view, and I can give you the minutes, and they just look at me. It's him saying something really stupid. This went on for ages, even though the council minutes definitely said all panel members should be trained. And to be honest, sometimes you just give up. So it seems here as if there's been an institutional decision, but individuals within the institution must act as if the decision has been made for it to have been made. If they do not, then it has not. So a decision made in the present about the future is overridden by the momentum of the past. The past becomes like that well-worn path what usually happens still happens. In this case, the head of personnel did not need to take the decision out of the minutes for the decision not to bring something into effect. I call this dynamic non-performativity. When naming something does not bring something into effect or when something is named in order not to bring something into effect. So the wall is that which keeps standing. And I think of the wall as a finding. Let me summarise the finding. What stops movement? Moves. So that means the mechanisms for stopping something are themselves mobile, which means if you witness the movement, you can be missing the mechanism. And I think this is really important because organisations are actually very good at moving things around. Creating evidence you're doing something is not the same thing as doing something. This is why I call diversity workers institutional plumbers. They have to work out not only where something is blocked, but how it is blocked. So in our example, what stops something from happening, it could have been the removal of the policy from the minutes. It could have been the failure of anyone at council to notice that removal, but it wasn't. It was the way in which those within the institution acted after the policy had been agreed. So agreeing to something becomes another way of stopping something from happening. And a diversity policy can come into existence without coming into use. So I noted earlier how a sign is often used to make a transition from something being in and out of use, such as our case of the post box. Institutions are also postal systems. So maybe the diversity worker deposits her policy in that post box because she assumes the box is in use. She's right to make that assumption because she's following the institution's own procedure. The post box that is not in use without any sign indicating as such might itself have another function to stop the policy from going through the system. The policy becomes dusty, rather like Marx's rusty sword, from rusty to dusty, so a policy can become unusable by not being used. But consider as well all of the energy that this practitioner expended on introducing a policy that doesn't do anything. The story of how the wall keeps standing is the same story as the story of how a diversity worker becomes shattered, as she says, sometimes you just give up. Maybe you end up feeling all used up, limp, spent, rather like this tube of toothpaste. 
Or maybe you fly off the handle to recall that broken cup, an expression that can mean to snap or to lose your temper. To lose a handle on things can mean to lose yourself. You become the one who can't handle it. You don't have to say anything to be heard as breaking something. Another practitioner described to me, you know, you go through that in these sorts of jobs where you've got to say something, you can just see people going, oh, here she goes. We both laugh, recognising that each other, recognise that scene. The famous killjoy, that leaky container, comes up here. She comes up in what we can hear. We hear each other in the wear and tear of the words we share. We hear what it's like to come up against the same thing over and over again. We imagine the eyes rolling as if to say, well, she would say that. And it was from experiences like this that I developed my equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. <laughs> so I think it's important to note as well that this policy that was stopped by not being used was a policy <coughs> about how academic appointments are made. Appointment panels are places to go if you want to learn more about how institutions are reproduced, how decisions are made about who is appointable, a much used word. A person in a diversity training session I attended shared that people in her department had an unofficial criteria for appointability, whether somebody was the kind of person you could take down to the pub. <laughs> they wanted somebody who they could inhabit the spaces with them, being with, being liked, someone they could relate to, have a drink with, fight with. I remember one time Mona Colour was considered for a job in my department. She worked on race and sexuality. And someone said in a meeting with concern that we already have Sarah, as in having one of us was more than enough. There was a murmured consensus that she replicated me, even though our work was actually very different. And there was no such concern about other areas. Concern, no concern. How things stay the same by seeing others as the same. So let's go back to my discussion of uses of use. An institution is, as we know, an environment. And environments are dynamic. It is because environments change that uses change. But an institution is also a container technology. You can reproduce something by stabilizing the requirements for what you need to survive or thrive in an environment. When that requirement has been stabilized, it no longer needs to be made explicit. Use becomes instead a question of fit. So remember Darwin's use of the architect metaphor. The builder uses a stone that happens to fit, so institutions are also built. It can appear as if the moment of use is hack, that this person is selected because they just happen to fit the requirements, while the light that stone is selected because it just happens to be the same shape and size as that hole in the wall. Hats can be used ideologically, as if they are here because they happen to fit, rather than they fit because of how the structure is built. A structure then becomes the gradual removal, if not elimination, of hack from use in the determination of a requirement for what you would need to survive or to thrive. So in Lamarck's model, use became inheritance and shaping form, it lessens the effort required to do something within an environment. When you fit, and fitting here can be formal, a question of form, you inherit the lessening of effort. Some have paths more clearly laid out for them because they already fit that requirement. So it's not just use, the constancy of use that eases their passage. For, as before, acquires a distinct resonance here. When a world is built for some, they come before others. This third section is called Not Fitting. So people do come to inhabit organisations that were not intended or built for them. You can make the cut without fitting. If you arrive into an organisation that's not built for you, you might experience a four as tight or even as tightening as restriction, it's like you can't breathe. If you're the one for whom an institution is intended, that four might be loose, you might not even notice it at all. The institution appears open because it was open to you. This is why I think of an institution as rather like an old garment. It has acquired the shape of those who tend to wear it, such that it's easier to wear if you have that shape. And this is why I think of privilege as an energy-saving device. Less effort is required to pass through when a world has been assembled around you. If you arrive with dubious origins, you are not expected to be here, so in getting here you are already disagreed with an expectation of who you are and what it is you can do, then an institution can feel just like the wrong shape. It doesn't fit. So Annette Coon, for instance, describes how, as a working class girl in a grammar school, she felt conspicuously out of place. 
And she described that sense of being out of place by giving us a biography of her school uniform, a biography indeed of youth, how by the time her ill-fitting uniform came to fit, it had become shabby and scruffy. <coughs> the word wear originally derives from the Germanic word for clothing. It then acquires a secondary sense of use up or gradually damage from the effect of continued use on clothes. <coughs> so it's not just that when something is used more, it fits better. If you cannot afford to keep buying new clothes, scruffiness can become a sign of not fitting. So not fitting can be about the body you have, about your own requirements. When you don't meet the requirements, you've become, to borrow Rose McGowan Thompson's important term, a misfit. She describes being a person with a disability in an ableist institution as like being a square peg in a round hole. Fitting becomes work for those who do not fit. You have to push, 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 and sometimes no amount of pushing will get you in or get you through. You can become a misfit given what has become a routine. An organisation that organises long meetings without any breaks assumes a body that can be seated without breaks. If someone arrives who cannot maintain his position, they do not meet the requirements. So if you were to lie down during that meeting, you would throw the meeting into crisis. I suspect that a social justice project requires throwing meetings into crisis. Perhaps then, because organisations are trying to avoid such crises, Misfits often end up in the same committees, otherwise known as the diversity committee. <laughs> so we might end up in the diversity committee because of who we are not. Not white, not cis, not able-bodied, not man, not straight. The more knots you are, the more committees you are. <laughs> but we see misfits even on these committees. A woman of colour academic describes, I was on the Equality and Diversity Group in the university, and as soon as I started mentioning things to do with race, they changed the portfolio who could be on the committee, and I was dropped. So I noted earlier that diversity might be used more because it does less. Well, the word race might be used less because it does more. Any use of the word race is heard as overuse of the word race. And she adds, whenever you raise something, the response is that you are not one of them. Whenever you raise something, you are not one of them. You don't fit, not one of them. Using words like race needs to amplify what makes you not fit, picking up what you are not. So perhaps then they're not, not what, not is heard as an exclamation point, as shouting, as insistence, a stress point, a sore point, even perhaps as a warning sign. So sometimes you turn up to that meeting and it's enough to bring a history up, a history that is bothersome, that gets in the way of an occupation of space. So a door can be closed because of who enters. At other times that door seems to be open, you might even be welcomed. Think of how diversity is often represented as an open door or as a tagline, minorities welcome, come in, come in. A tagline, tag on, tag along. But just because they welcome you, it doesn't mean they actually expect you to turn up. <laughs> Another woman of colour academic describes her department as a revolving door. Women and minority staff enter only to head right back out again. Whoosh, whoosh. You can be kept out by what you find out when you get in. The nuclear family, that is an institution that might appear to be open perhaps to the queer aunties. Come in, come in. The heterosexuality can also become an occupation, filling the room like water in a cup. Full, full of still, no room, no room. Greetings, statements, heterosexuality given casually for children as projections of their future. Even my dog Poppy has been given such an assignment. If only Poppy could meet Harry, they could be boyfriend and girlfriend. <laughs> It can feel like you're watching yourself disappear, watching your own life unravel thread by thread. No one has willed or intended your disappearance. They are kind. They are welcoming, but just slowly, just slowly, as talk of the family or of heterosexuality as the future of lives that you do not live, just slowly, just slowly you disappear and you get out and you head right to the gate pub really quickly. <laughs> I think back to our post box. There could have been another sign on that post box that said, birds welcome. I would call that sign a non-performative. It teaches us how we cannot do things with words, because if the post box was still in use, the birds would be dislodged by the letters, and that's destroyed before it could be created. You can stop others from using a space by how that space is used. So I noted earlier that use can be a restriction of possibility that is material. You can use a paper for some things and not others because of the material qualities of paper. But it's not just that use is a restriction of possibility that is material. Restrictions can also become material through use. 
So what is material to some? Material. Leaving you with no room, no room to breathe, to nest, or to be, can be what does not matter to others because it does not get in the way of their occupational space. It might even enable that very occupation. That occupation. You can turn up and you can find the space is already occupied. You turn up at a hotel with your girlfriend and you say you've booked a room. They catch you in a glance and they hesitate. A hesitation can speak volumes. The reservation says your booking is for a double rock bed. Is that right, madam? Eyebrows are raised, a glance slides over the two of you catching enough detail. Are you sure, madam? Yes, that's right, double bed. You have to say it. You have to keep saying it again, firmly. I mentioned early my equation, rolling eyes equals feminist pedagogy. I have another one. Raised eyebrows equals lesbian feminist pedagogy. <laughs> <laughs> Follows you wherever you go still. One time after a querying, are you sure, madam? Are you sure, madam? You enter twin bats. Do you go down? Do you try again? It can be trying. And sometimes it's too trying. It's too much. And you pull those two bull bets together and find other ways of huddling. Queer use. Another way of huddling, of keeping each other warm. The sum to be is to be in question. Is that your sister or your husband? A question asked by a neighbour to me once. <laughs> Who are you? What are you? Where are you from? Where are you really from? As a brown woman living in the UK, I'm used to being asked that question. Where are you really from? It's a way of being told we're not from here. Brown, not from here, not here, not. These questions can dislodge you. You can come to wait for them, waiting to be dislodged. Change your relation to that lodge. And that lodge then becomes how you are received. You might walk into a seminar room with a white man. You're both professors. But you can feel the gaze land upon him, plop, plop. You don't appear as a professor because you are not how a professor usually appears. And he is a guest as a professor. So if you were to say, hey, I'm a professor too, you would be heard as drawing attention to yourself. <laughs> Diversity works, how you often end up appearing as drawing attention to yourself. You come to stick out rather like a sore thumb. It can then be assumed you're talking about this, about walls, say, because you are sore. A lecture I interviewed for my complaint project describes, I've been told I have a chip on my shoulder, that I've got a chip on my shoulder because I'm Jewish, that I have a chip on my shoulder because I'm far and living in this country and you're upset about Brexit, or because you're gay and you're just looking for the problems. You start thinking, am I looking for these problems? I just turn it inward. Is it me? Is it my fault? I lie awake at night thinking, is it actually a problem with me here? Chip, chip, chip. If we chip away at the old block, no wonder they keep finding that chip on our shoulders. So, the more knots you are, the more chips they find. But it can be hammering, and you can end up feeling that the problem is with you. And that feeling, I would add, is it me here? Am I the problem? Is a feeling of structure. A feeling that is about how you keep being stopped from doing something, or from being something. What you have to say or to do in order not to be passed over is often heard about a complaint as a complaint about being passed over. And sometimes we do indeed have to complain about what or who is passed over. When I shared the reasons for my resignation in protest at the failure of the institution to deal with sexual harassment, I quickly became the cause of damage. What a mess, Sarah. Look how much work you've created. So I became a leaky pipe. Drip, drip. Organisations will try and contain that damage. That's how public relations <coughs> works, as damage limitation. Scratching away, you, you, you're mopping up those scratches, hiding them, concealing them. And this is how diversity too often takes institutional form as damage limitation. But there is hope here, because they cannot mop up all of our mess. One spillage can lead to more coming out. Can lead, does lead. A leak can be a lead. A leak can be a feminist lead. After I shared my reasons for my resignation, many people shared with me their stories, their own institutional battles. So just to loosen the screw a little bit, a tiny little bit, and you might have an explosion. We need more explosions. This is my conclusion. Queer vandalism. <laughs> it's actually quite a long conclusion. <laughs> Damage limitation. This is how organisations end up using paper, paper as papering over, to paper over cracks, the leaks, the means by which blemishes on the institutional record are not recorded. Perhaps these blemishes become ours. We become their damaged goods. Paper too can be papered over. In queer phonology, I called into question a fantasy of a paperless philosophy. As part of a critique of how philosophy might be oriented toward a certain kind of body, one for whom materiality would be an unnecessary distraction. 
one who has time free for contemplation, but how others do the paperwork, the domestic work, the care work, the diversity work. So paper matters. And paper can also be queer. Paper can be used queerly. I'm reminded of Hami Baba's discussion of the uses of, Bible, of the Bible in his classic essay, Science Taken for Wonders. Baba cites the missionary register from 1817. Still, every Indian would gladly receive a Bible, and why? That he may store it up as a curiosity, sell it for a few pikes, or use it for waste paper. Such, it is well known, has been the common fate of those Bibles distributed in this place. Some are seen laid up as curiosities by those who cannot read them. Some have been bartered in the markets, and others have been thrown into the snuff shops and used as wrapping paper. The Bible, in not being properly read, is willfully destroyed. The Bible becomes a curiosity, reused or usable for other purposes, wrapping paper, waste paper. Of course, the missionaries narrate the fate of the Bible in the colonies as a result of the inability of the natives to be able to digest it. It is true that such the natives as can read have leisure enough to read the whole Bible, but they are so indolent, so fond of eating and sleeping, or so lost in their vicious pursuits, that unless something at once brief, simple, and powerful is presented, it will not be likely to be read by them, and if read, it will not be likely to arrest their torpid and sensual minds. So if racism is used as an explanation of the failure of digestion, rendering the racial other queer subject, vicious pursuits, torpid and sensual minds, racism is used because of the failure of the colonial mission to transform the minds of colonized into willing vessels. The demand to use something properly is a demand to revere what has been given by the colonizer. So empire as gift comes with use instructions. If not to be subjected to the will of the colonizer is to queer use or even to become queer through misuse, back to my starting point, perversion and self-revelation, then to queer use is to live in proximity to violence and the threat of violence. To queer use is to linger on the material qualities of that which you were supposed to pass over. It is to recover a potential from all those materials that have been left behind, all the things that you can do with paper if you don't follow the instructions. That recovery can be dangerous. So the creativity of queer use becomes an act of destruction, whether intended or not, not digesting something, spitting it out, putting it about. So queer use, in other words, can be framed as vandalism, as a willful destruction of the venerable and the beautiful. So earlier I described diversity workers as institutional plumbers. We might, from that description, assume that diversity workers are appointed to unblock the system. But a blockage is how that system is working. The system is working by stopping those who are trying to transform the system. So this means that to transform a system, we have to stop the system from working. When you stop the machine from working, you damage the machine. So the plumber might need to be a vandal, or we might need to pass as plumbers fixing the leak in order to become vandals, making it bigger. We might have to throw a wrench in the works or to become, to use Sarah Franklin's terms, wenches in the works. <laughs> throw our bodies into the system, trying to stop the same old body from being assembled, doing the same old thing. We might have to park our bodies right in front of that gate, become quite willing to be an destruction. Think of how so often protest is framed as vandalism, not only as damage to property, but as an expression of the desire to cause that damage. We can, of course, become destructions by virtue of existing in the way that we do. Even to open up a question about how to live, how to love, how to be a gender subject, say, <coughs> even to open up that question can be framed as damage. Queer as snap, snap, as if you are cutting up the, pair, the family with a pair of scissors just by arranging your life in a different way. Not following something as destroying something, no wonder they find us to be destructive. And so much is re reproduced by that requirement to follow. Within the academy, you might be asked to follow the well-trodden paths of citation. To cite properly is to cite those deemed to have already had the most influence. The more a path is used, the more a path is used. The more he is cited, the more he is cited. And that path is get clear through work. Occupation depends upon erasure, such and such white man might become an originator of a concept, an idea as becoming seminal, by removing traces of those who were here before. Indigenous feminists, black feminists, and feminists of colour have crafted new roots by what or who we refuse to let disappear. One thinks here of work by Zoe Todd, Eve Tuck, and Alexis Pauling Gunn. 
So speaking of whiteness in the academy or colonialism as a context in which the Enlightenment philosophy happened is to bring up the scandal of the vandal. Decolonizing the curriculum as a project has indeed been framed as an act of vandalism, a willful destruction of our universal, as knocking off the heads of statues, as snapping at the thrones of the philosopher kings. If throwing up the question of how to live or who to read is deemed as damaging, we can turn a judgment into a project. And vandalism becomes a tactic when we have to cut a message off from a body, when a message, if traced to a source, will compromise that source. If organisations try to contain what would damage a reputation, we find other ways to get that information out. We might use guerrilla tactics, and we have feminist and queer histories to draw upon here, write names of harassers on books or on walls. So yes, those scratches, we are back to those scratches. What is treated as damage can be a message sent out. We can reach each other through what appears as mere scratch and scribble. This requirement to be inventive is not just a matter of communication. <coughs> Audrey Lord, in her poem, A Little Need for Survival, evokes those of us who love in doorways coming and going in the hour between dawns. You might have to use a less used path to turn that doorway into a meeting place. You might have to try to slide by undetected because being seen is dangerous when you're seen as dangerous. Queer youth then can be a matter of survival, becoming fainter as your best chance of being at all. And so, there are queer possibilities not only in use, how materials can be picked up when we refuse instructions, but in being not of use. And much used books might give us a glimpse of these other fainter trails in this history. There is a discussion in origins of vestigial organs, parts that are no longer useful but linger, however dwindle, such as the small eye of the blind mole. These parts are sometimes called leftovers. Vestigiality is a retention of structures or attributes of ancestral species that have lost their functionality, which is another version, I would say, of the strange temporality of use. Let me quote from Origins. Rudimentary parts, as it is generally admitted, are apt to be highly variable. Their variability seems to result from their uselessness and consequently from natural selection having had no power to check deviations from the structure as the centre to a lot of potential. Now, uselessness, it can be a deadly assignment. I think we know this, a history of whom and what is discarded, how the fragments are swept up and away, but we can pick up the pieces. We can find other ways of telling the history of use and uselessness, hearing a queer potential in a sentence from a much used book. That potential, not being selected, is not to be checked, to have more room to roam, to vary, to deviate, to proliferate. So, if queer use can be about survival, <coughs> following the less well-used path in order not to be detected. Queer use can also be about creativity, the variations that are possible when you're not selected for going the right way. But not being selected can also mean, I think we know this, not being supported, and so we create our own support systems, queer handles, how we hold on, how our life can go on, when we are shattered, because we are shattered. No wonder then, in our history, as collective as they are, the stories of the exhaustion of inhabiting worlds that do not accommodate us, the stories of the weary and the worn and the teary and the torn, are the same stories as the stories of inventiveness, of creating something, of making something. I think of Lord. I always think of Lord. Audrey Lord spoke of herself as a writer when she was dying. She wrote, I'm going to write fire until it comes out of my ears, my eyes, my nose holes, everywhere. And so it's every breath I breathe, I'm going to go out like a fucking meteor. <laughs> so she did. And so she did. She goes out, she makes something. She calls into capacity to make things through heat be erotic. Lord describes, there is a difference between painting a black fence and writing a poem, but only one quantity. And there is, for me, no difference between writing a good poem and moving into sunlight against the body of a woman I love. Words flickering with life, like sunlight on her body. A love poem, a lover as poem. We can break open a container to make things. We can watch the words spill, they spill all over you. I think too of Sherry Moraga's poem, The Welder. Moraga speaks of heat being used to shape new elements, to create the intimacy of steel melting, the fire that makes sculpture of your lives, builds buildings. We might have to build our own buildings when the world does not accommodate our desires, when you are blocked, or when your existence is viewed with suspicion or even just raised eyebrows, yes, they are pedagogy, you have to come up with your own systems for getting yourself 
through turning that kitchen table into a publishing house. How inventive. Quite something, not from nothing, something from something. A kitchen table becomes a publishing house. A doorway becomes a meeting place. A post box becomes a nest. Can this be a queer inheritance? How we inherit from past struggles to exist, small modifications, the widening of a passageway or an opening just enough to enable more to get by or to get through, a sociability as worn as wisdom, secret passages, meeting places, passing information down the line about where to go, about what to do. So much can happen from the struggle to support an existence, from the friction of being rubbed up the wrong way, those queer inversions, bits that end up the wrong way up, what we cobble together out of necessity from the parts at hand. How odd that from necessity we might become alive <coughs> to possibility. How odd, how queer. So we can turn this image into our queer teacher. It teaches us that it is possible for those being strangers to take up residence in spaces that have been assumed for long and for others. That postbox could have remained in use, the nest destroyed before it was completed and the birds displaced. A history of use is indeed a history of such displacements, many violent. Displacements that are often unrecognised because of how things remain occupied. And it's because of that occupation, that settling of history, that weight, that queer use requires more than an act of simply affirming the queerness of use. Queer use is the work we have to do to queer use. Queer use is work. It is hard and painstaking work. It is collective and creative work. It is diversity work. And this image is something else to teach us. Creating a shelter and disrupting usage can refer to the same action. Thank you.
uses aren't recognised as uses, that some beings aren't recognised as beings with a relation to the land that might be one of use. And I think, I mean, what one's response to the kind of like Lockean model of use would, could be to say, well, there are other ways of relating to land other than use. Mm -hmm. And that is one way of responding, but another response is to say that we need to think differently about how we understand use, so that use doesn't conjure up a relationship of property, of mining us that use can be about intimacy and shared memories, like the well-used goat path on the, on the Greek island that gives you a history of where animals have been. That memory that is in the land itself, telling us a story of past being. So I think there will be lots of ways in which one could really decenter the human as part of the project of queer use. So give you a slightly longer answer. Okay. Then just, yes. <laughs> question here. So then here's the question. What do you do if you are the wall? You are strange. Why are you the wall? How do you get a person like that? How do you get to see, get them to see that they're the wall? Well, I mean, I think that, that, that's a difficult question. I think a lot of the ways in which these institutions operate is for people just not being the wall, being there at all, let alone seeing themselves as being the obstacle to the progression of others. So getting people to recognize something that it's not only not stopping them, but enabling their progression is really, really hard. And the diversity work becomes the hardest when you're actually trying to, to modify institutions in such a way that some would feel they are losing the position that they hold. And the defensiveness and the anxiety and the discomfort that surrounds anyone who tries to show that these walls are out there determining some people, some people's speed of progression and others being slowed down. And the defensiveness is, is very institutionalised. You can actually physically feel it in the room. So what do you do? Well, you, you work hard. I mean, it's not, it's not up to me to convince other people that they are the wall. But I write the work, I do the work. I, I write to the people who recognise the wall in the experience that they can't. But I, because I think it's really, really important that we don't always write to those who send to the subject that, 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 that they don't see the walls at all, you know, because I think most of the history of philosophy has been written to those who are the walls that don't see it. So I'm, I'm not interested in writing back to those subjects. But I do think there is political work to be done, and I do think people can recognise these histories and these institutions and become committed to the project of transforming institutions to enable them to be open. I do genuinely think that can happen. And when it does happen, it has to create new ways of working, new forms of collaboration, a new sense that we can create paths out of the less used trails, that we can recover histories that have not disappeared entirely from the institutions that they have been able to be built. But that has to be a project and you have to be very careful because sometimes, I mean, you, I, I've been in, in spaces where people have been invested in themselves as being very, very critical as knowing all about the walls, but haven't necessarily translated that into self-recognition of one's own, own, own wallness. And that can be very, very <laughs> difficult. Uh, and, and especially in, in whiteness, and whiteness is an activist space where people can be very, very sort of aware, invested in being critical, anti-racist subjects, and not think of the fact that themselves as occupying space through that self perceptional <laughs> criticality. So, yeah, I think we probably recognise that problem, and I think the work that we're doing has to be collaborative and collective war work. Thank you. <laughs> There's a question right at the back, and then I'm going to teach you a little is a small kind of clarification on that comment. Do you think that work is necessarily combative and hostile? Can we take a couple? Yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. uh, I was just thinking 
about the relationship between use and presence, and obviously we talk about that in terms of occupation as well, but just how when race is used, it's already overused, <coughs> or when there is already a woman of color in a department, another woman of color is an over-presence in that way. And just the kind of relationship between that and how in those cases, a presence is always already an occupation, even when it's not meant to be. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I can't tell them. Yeah, is it necessarily <coughs> hostile and combative? I mean, no. I think what I would say is that when you're doing certain kinds of work, however you do the work, you are seen as being combative and hostile. And I think a lot of us who are involved in diversity work, particularly people of colour involved in diversity work, you can enter a room and you're already perceived as being hostile before you say anything. And so you have to live your life in relationship to a perception of you being that by saying, oh, I'm not that, you might smile a little bit more and be that, ah, you know, in order to count the perception of you as being hostile. And thus, that perception of you as being hostile becomes a thing in the room that you're relating to in one way or another. So the perception of combativeness and hostility becomes a physical thing in the room that you have to negotiate. And I think that's what we need to sort of look at. And I think some of us might try to avoid being, being as we're perceived to be. And I think there's a lot of, I call that institutional passing, where you try not to be the minority who's always putting their hand up and saying, well, what about that, that this, all white, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> um, uh, and the institutional passing can work, but it can also be that you are then removing from the very room the things that make it difficult for you to be there. So sometimes I actually think it's actually almost better to use the words that make other people uncomfortable mm -hmm. and just see what happens. But I think we all make different choices. Uh, we had different strategies and tactics about basically how to handle being in institutions that have these histories that manifest as atmospheres in the room. And that, you know, really goes back to, to uh, well, to, to your point, because I think that that's what following youth has really taught me, and what I mean by thickening youth, is the sense that, that just a, a, a person can arrive, a body can arrive, a word can be used, and it's, it's bringing back, it's bringing up this prior history that it, that it gets stuck to, that it, 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 it can feel like they have no room left at all. And um, I think uh, one of the reasons I've tried to conclude with quite a strong emphasis on inventiveness mm -hmm. is because actually a lot of that inventiveness when we try and find new tactics for handling being in these institutions, it, it comes from the experience of things being so tight and so occupied already. And one of the reasons I really emphasise occupation, I use that, uh, uh, some of you will know that I've been trying to find an occupied toilet sign. Um, because for my book, I can't use that one for the copyright, blah, blah. And <laughs> all, the, all the signs in, the, in, the, in, in England <laughs> say engaged. And I'm like, I want the word occupied. Because that word is a history relationship to the colonial encounter. But I also think it, it, it tells me something about how rooms become occupied and filled by how they are, they are used. And, but it's because of that occupation, I think of it as really heavy, that there is so much inventiveness around what we actually do when we get into those rooms. Um, th that actually a lot of the inventiveness comes from the fact that there's so little room. And it might be quite small acts of misuse or reuse. Um, it might be smiling while plotting. Um, it might be, you know, the different ways in which, because we recognise these histories, we find other ways to try and loosen things up so that we can actually do the work through and with each other. Thank you. I think we're going to leave it there for tonight. Um, so could you all join me in saying thank you so much.